worship. I am your worship. I have more than a song. I have more than a song. Today, today, today I brought myself. I brought myself. More than your sacrifice. I have more than a song. I have more than a song. Today, 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 today I brought myself. I brought myself. I am your worship. I am your worship.
that our hearts rejoices in the fact that you are one of God Lord when we have no words we will let our hallelujah resound from inside of our bellies to the outside Father we thank you for choosing us we thank you for sending your son to die we thank you for putting us on a trajectory with you that delivers your heart for us. Lord, to you be all the praise. Lord, to you be all the glory. Thank you for today's worship experience, oh God. Thank you for the empowerment service. Thank you for your children in this room. Thank you for the ones online, oh God. Thank you for what you have done by your words in us. Thank you for what you are doing by your word in us. Thank you for what you will do by your word in us. To you, O Father, be all the praise. To you, O Lord, be all the glory. To you, O Lord, be all adoration. Thank you, God of heaven. To you be all the praise, O God. In Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Good afternoon. Please be seated. God bless you. Welcome to church. If you're joining us online, we welcome you. Um, my name is Bidemi Makmodi, and um, this is the Well Oasis International, where sons come to manifest. Hallelujah. We've been in a series in the last 11 weeks or more, and um, it's titled The Journey. 
And last week we looked at the diet. Because we talked about the fact that what you eat when you travel can impact upon your trip. Hallelujah. And we said that when he came to the diet on a journey with God, the trick is to make sure you feed at the level of your responsibility. Hallelujah. We said that the trick is to make sure you feed at the level of your responsibility. That if you are maturing to become a son, you should not focus on taking milk and milk and milk alone of the word. While the milk of the word, the milk of the word has its place, if you really want to be the son that can be trusted on this journey, you have to transition to meat and ultimately to what? To chewing bones. Hallelujah. We saw last week that um, as we progress in God, our diet will also evolve. And we said that whether we are feeding on milk right now, we have started to feed on the meat. It is the word of God that is the diet for the journey. So make sure that you have a word as you start. And make sure you can go back to that word. We looked at five ways to interact with and transact with the word of God. We talked about reading the word. We talked about studying the word. We talked about meditating on the word. We talked about investigating to the word to prove it. And ultimately, we talked about application. Hallelujah. Today, um, we're moving um, straight ahead into the journey, part number 11. And today, we're looking at the focus on the journey. Now, if you, for instance, you are, you're going somewhere, you're the one driving, you know it is deadly not to focus in the direction you are going. But you also know that as you're journeying and you're driving forward, there is something called the rear view mirror. Yes? You must know what's happening behind you if you want to be safe. And there are some things called the side mirrors if you're driving. Those side mirrors tell you whether someone crazy is driving beside you so that you can shift out of the way. Or whether as you're veering to the right or to the left, there's someone close bes uh, beside you who is too close for comfort. The point is that you can't make a trip without focus. Yes? You cannot make a trip without focus in the physical just the same way you cannot make a trip in God without knowing what your focus should be and sticking with that. Praise Jesus. Praise Jesus. If you look at Luke chapter 9, uh, yes, Luke 9, 62, it says that he that puts his hand on the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. One way when you look at it is that we think that that is a scripture that has to do only with commitment. That, oh, once you uh, sign up and you are enlisted or you are conscripted for this journey, then you want to make sure that you are committed. But there is no commitment that happens without focus. <laughs> Hallelujah. So when you get on a trip with God, such as the one we are in in 2022, you want to make sure that your focus is what it should be. Your focus is what it should be. The man of God said, I have set my face as a flint. Hallelujah. Amen. So what does focus mean? Focus is the center of interest or activity. That's dictionary definition for the word focus. The center of interest or activity. Focus is the state or quality of having or producing clear visual definition. The state or quality of, pro of having or producing clear visual definition. To succeed on our journey with God, what we focus on and how we focus and our attitude as we focus is critical. I found that recently and I was actually reminded that success does not lie only in our intelligence but in our focus. What that means is that there are people who are not as smart as some other people we know, but they are excelling because they have this tunnel vision focus. They have this laser focus. They are so focused that they see nothing else but what they have set their hearts to achieve. 
So you find that there are intelligent people who don't deliver on their potential. And there are people who are not half as intelligent, but can deliver on their potential like that. Because they are focused enough to do the work and to pay the price so that they arrive where they're going. Hallelujah. Amen. So our capacity to embrace the reality of our journey and give full attention to the right things will determine if we will succeed on this journey. Remember that I said that this journey it, um, 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 begins from somewhere and is headed somewhere else. Yes? Do you remember? So we have a destination in mind. Remember also I told you that the point from where you start is not a bad point. It's always an exciting point to know that I step into a journey with God. And to have an idea how you end up is enough to keep you going sometimes. But I did tell us that what is in between, between when you start and when you finish, is the thing that is what tends to trip us, it's what tends to whatever it is that can happen, happens in the in between. Hallelujah. Amen. So you find that when you are on a trip with God, you must give full attention to the right things. Because otherwise, you can't arrive where you're going. And if you give full attention to the right things, it will determine if you would succeed or not. Hallelujah. So your success is determined by what you focus on. Now, why focus is making the right thing the center of our interest and attention? Our why focus is making the right thing the center of our interest, thinking, and action? I have also come to learn that even within focus, perspective is a major determinant. Let me say it in another way. Your perspective concerning your journey and a thing will determine what you choose to focus on. If your perspective is wrong, let me say it in Instagram language. If your point of view is wrong, you will focus on the wrong thing. And if you focus on the wrong thing, you will not succeed at arriving at your end goal. Hallelujah. In Colossians chapter 3 verse number 2, the Bible says that we should set our minds on the things that are, have, that are above and not on earthly things. Even the Bible is clear that there are many things that are around us that will catch our attention. But we have to determine the one that we will give our minds and our hearts to. In Colossians 3, it says that you should set your minds on the things that are above. And not on the earthly things. Because if you focus on the things that are earthly, then the odds are on this journey, you may not make it to the destination. But I am persuaded that we will make it. In the name of Jesus. My point is that perspective, de perspective determines what we focus on. Because how you read a situation will tell you what you should focus on. Let me try and explain it to you. So you enter this room and you see four people quarreling. And two of them or three of them are your best friends. And you take a look, you listen for a bit. From the conversation, you can already tell that your three friends ganged up on the other person. But if you are emotional enough to take sides with your friends, it will just determine what you will be focusing on. But because obviously you won't be able to focus on truth in that situation, Yes. So my point is that your perspective, no matter what, at every junction on this trip with God, on this journey with God, your perspective will determine what your focus is. If you woke up today and you were convinced and confident that you are a son of God, you will act differently from the one who feels like they've fallen from grace already. So how your perspective will determine your focus, it will determine your attitude within your focus. So when we're talking about focus, I do not want you to forget that perspective is a critical part of focus. Do you understand it? Okay, so you, as someone enters this room and gives you three different things. Number one, um, let me see, let me see, let me Number one, there is no food at home. Number two, someone is going to die in six months. And number three, your shoes are dirty. All these three things are big problems for different people. 
But all three were said to you. Number one, there is no food at home. Number two, someone is going to die in six months. Number three, why are your shoes so dirty? And then all of a sudden, all you can do is look at your shoes and think, really, why did not I not wash my shoes? Hey, my shoes are dirty. Oh, this, the heel used to be, the soles used to be white. Now they, are, they look like brown. What has happened? If you consistently focus on your shoe, you will forget that part of the three things he told you was that someone was dying in six months. Because in that, in that moment, what you are focused on is how you look in the moment. And the moment your perspective is that narrow, you will forget to ask, is there something that we can do so that the person that is supposed to die does not, that is meant to die does not die? Or what do we do to make sure that when we get back home, there will be food? Now, when you take a look at these three things, in the order of importance, your shoes are the least. But because you are very wrapped up in you, the fact that your shoes are dirty can derail from every other thing that we are talking about today. Does that make sense? I want you to see how just one word out of place, one conversation out of place can negate focus. And the Lord says that on this journey, we need focus. We need focus. If you go with me to the book of Numbers chapter 13, Numbers 13, you know this account. We all know it. Numbers chapter 13, the account of the children of Israel when Moses sent 12 spies to the promised land to go and do what? To go and spy out the land. Moses picked 12 men and said, go into that land and spy it. The 12 of them went, inclusive of Joshua, uh, Joshua and Caleb. Now, what are the names of the remaining 10? Don't read your Bible. Tell me, the, and tell me the name of one of them. We can't remember. But there were 12 men that were sent that day to go and check out the land. And their assignment was simple. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, send down 12 men that they may search the land of Canaan which i give unto the children of israel of every tribe of their fathers shall ye send a man everyone a ruler among them and moses by the commandment of the lord sent them from the wilderness of paran all those men were heads of the children of israel then they mentioned their names and what was the conversation? And Moses sent them, verse 17, to spy out the land of Canaan and said unto them, Get you up this way southward and go up into the mountain and see the land, number one. See the land, what it is. And the people that dwell it therein, that is see the land, what it is. See the people that dwell in it. Whether they are strong people or weak people. Whether they are few people or they are many and what the land is that they dwell in whether it be a good land or a bad land and what cities they be that they dwell in whether in tents or in strongholds and what the land is whether it be fat or lean whether there be wood therein or not and be ye of good courage and bring of the fruit of the land now the time was was the time of the first grapes so the assignment was go there if there are bad people there, tell us. If there are good people there, tell us. If the land is flowing with milk and honey as God had promised, let us know. If the land is lean, let us know. If they built their cities with fortresses, tell us. If they lived in tents, tell us. This was military recon. Go there and bring us great and bring us this specific answers to these questions. What that meant was this man couldn't go there and come back and speak christianese pay attention to me they couldn't go there and see that the cities were fortified and come and say the cities were simple cities this is military they had to report exactly what they saw i am sure something is happening to your doctrine on this scripture already 
Because what we thought is they went there and they came back and they just spoke negative things without really having... No, they didn't send them to go and express faith. They sent them to go and assess their opponent and come back and give... So they were supposed to go and come back and say there were 24 giants. The walls were higher than the buildings. All those things were fine. But here's also what it was. I don't know whether you've read um, The Art of War or if you've read anything on military tactics. They were also not to come back with opinions. Their opinion didn't matter. And facts was what they were supposed to go find and come. So they went and they came back. And let's see their report in verse 25. And they returned from searching of the land after 40 days. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and all, to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and also unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. So number one, they brought the fruit of the land and they told him and said, we came unto the land whither thou sentest us and surely it floweth with milk and honey and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land. You know, it's part of their, their assignment. So it was fine. And the cities were walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. All of this was still fine. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coasts of Jordan. This is the report that they brought, yes? And this is exactly what Moses needed to know. So Caleb, who was one of the twelve, said, Let us go up at once, verse 30, and possess it, for we are able to overcome it. Caleb said, All these things are true. You know, Caleb did not say they were lying. He said they saw well. But let's go. We can take it. Verse 31. But the man that went up with him <coughs> said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. What did I say they were not allowed to proffer? Obedience. Focus. This is, in those days when we were going to school, well, these days if we go to school, they have to pay us to go to school. We're all going to school again. If we pay somebody to torture us, like Pastor Val is being tortured. If I pay you, in fact, I can't pay you to torture me anymore. Uh, not, but in those days, if they gave you a question and you answered and you ended this verse 31, it's extra syllables, yes? Over syllables. What does that happen? Over ITK. Because nobody asked you whether you can take it or you cannot take it. But focus. They, the moment Caleb said, let's go and take it. They said, ah, we cannot go. The people that are there, we will not be able to go up against them. For they are stronger than we. Now I need you to understand that they would not have taken 12 men who were civilians to go and spy out a land. These were military men. And look at their conversation. Let's go on. And, and they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel saying, the land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. If the land ate it, the inhabitants, would they meet somebody there? So, but their point of view is going crazy. They say the land eats its people. Anyone that dwells in that land, the land will eat them. And then they say, as on top of that, the land eats its people, but we saw the sons of Anak there. <laughs> it says, and we saw in it men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. Let's even just say, okay, their fear is speaking. But look at the next, and they now said, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. 
So, of course, we know that it's okay. You can be grasshopper to yourself. I can be grasshopper to myself, my circles. But to stand and determine that I'm a grasshopper to myself and he do sees me as grasshopper is a problem. So they went on, they say, we are as grasshopper, we were as grasshopper, grasshoppers in our own eyes. And so were we in their sight. Do you know that these people did not say one word? That's the enemy did not, possibly didn't even see them. Nobody spoke to them. They came back and they drew a conclusion. So their focus was shifted from number one, the scope of their assignment. Their focus had been shifted from the scope of their assignment. Number two, their focus has shifted from the fact that they did not come to the promised land of their own accord. There was a God that sent them to the promised land and made them a promise that he was going to give them this land. Then they shifted. You see, the moment your focus begins to wane or drop or shift, it continues to go. The bar just becomes lower and lower and lower and lower. And before you know it, anything goes. They came back, they got to a point and said, ha, when we saw those giants, eh, we felt like grasshoppers. It was still low, but not low enough. The moment they turned and said, even those people were sure in their sight we were as grasshoppers, they nailed their own coffin. If these ones were taken to war, I promise you, they will lose. Focus. 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 We are not able to take the land. The land, it's, in, it is, it's a, inhabitants. The men, they were men of great stature. They were giants. We were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And even in their sight, the way we were as grasshoppers. Take a look at it again. The people of the land had not spoken. Not a word. But the moment the spies took their eyes off the fact that they had a promise from God, the moment they, they took the, their sight off the fact that the land had held everything that God had described to, to them, a land flowing with milk and honey, the moment they took their eyes off the capacity of the God that they were on a journey with, they put on filters that looked at their size. And they put on filter that saw themselves through the lens of their own eyes in the minds of all the people. What are you focusing on? You know, it's amazing how God has been um, setting us up in this place. We just finished, um, um, how do you say, the feeling of possibility thinking that Stashola took us through. Extremely important that on this journey with God, you settle in your heart where you know you are going to end up. Extremely important. Because what you decide or where you decide you will end up is where you will end up. You know, I was hoping, you know, I was hoping that Stashola will use the Obama campaign um, 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 this thing. You, what was it? Everybody has said a black president was not possible. That the day had not come. Two words, three words. Yes, we can. That was all. It doesn't have to be complicated to build the kind of resilience that, you, that delivers the result. It doesn't have to be... It was, they might have had massive strategies, though, but what they sold to the crowd. Are you going to try and sell to someone in Louisiana somewhere a complicated theory? The theory was simple. Yes, we can. It, it is not possible that somebody will forget that. So when they get up and they try to go and someone says, a black president, the day has not come. The response is simple. Yes, we can. That became the focus. It became the focus. It was no longer really about the politics. It was no longer really about the parties. It became about a black president being possible. Yes. What is your focus? I found that that focus or the power of focus is distilled at three levels and dimensions. The power of focus is distilled three levels and three dimensions. 
three levels, all three dimensions, I should say. Number one is focus thinking. Your focus is determined by your thought patterns. What you think determines what you give your attention and your time to. Remember that we said that the definition of focus, dictionary definition, is the center of interest or activity. So as a man thinketh, as Tashola says, so is he. So what you think, whatever your thinking is focused on, determines the results that your life produces. That's dimension number one. Dimension number two is focus time. So it's, all, it's one thing to be focused on a thing. It's another thing to be focused on that thing a lot of the time. Do you see it? A wise man said that time is life. So if you squander time, you squander life. Time is what? If you squander time, so when you have things in front of you to do, and you Netflix half of your day, you, in your mind you think, oh, I didn't get the thing done. I, you know, I, I wasted the time on Netflix. Actually, you wasted 12 hours of your life. You squandered 12 hours of your life because time can never be regained. Do you understand this conversation? So again, focus is, um, is processed or the power of focus is distilled at three levels or dimensions. Number one, focused thinking. Number two, focused time. How much time do you spend on the things that don't build you? How much time do you spend on the things that you are invested in? The third one is focused action. The third dimension is focused action. The, this speaks to the consistency with which we work focused on a thing. If you take action consistently as regarding a specific thing, it is bound to be able to deliver the results that it has. On Friday, I released a, pod, a podcast. I, call, I titled it the All Effort Matters. All effort matters. And the idea is when you are talking, when we're talking about focus, sometimes the result is not readily um, visible. So the result may be something that is years and maybe decades ahead of us. But what we give, number one, our reasoning, our capacity, or our thinking to, or our thoughts pattern to consistently, most of the time, and we back up with effort. You see, the thing is not whether the effort we take or not. That's not what it is. Compare this conversation in Numbers 13 to the conversation in Gideon and in, in Joshua when Gideon took 300 men to a battle. What God wanted was effort. God wasn't looking at the so sometimes your action may not is like the man that want, that that was trying to break or open a rock. He wanted to break a rock to pieces. So for many days and months, he'd go with his heavy hammer and he just continued to hit on this rock. And the rock was not giving way on the outside. What he didn't realize was that rocks begin to crack from the inside. So he kept at it and he kept at it and he kept at it. One day after many months, he took a look at it and he thought to himself, I'm done. I've been at this thing for so long and it has refused to crack on the surface. And because it's not cracking on the surface, I'm giving up and he turned away. And as he was, as he left, a young boy came and threw a, kicked a ball at the rock. And the rock disintegrated. It was remaining one, just one stroke for the rock to break open. But he had gotten tired because he couldn't consistently be focused on what he was convinced at some point on his journey was what was going to lead him where he was going. On this journey that we are on, the things that I'm focused on will determine my results. 
I'm telling you the truth. That's why when you, when you do your New Year resolutions, which is what you do, and I've been telling you not to do them again, you won't listen. Because you never keep them anyway. You find that the first thing on the list that you do and do and do and do is usually the thing that you find yourself excelling in or having results to show. But you see, just because it's at the top of the list does not mean that it is the most important item that you should focus on in your life in that time. Does that make sense? Okay, I'm supposed to be preaching, not trying to coach you into something. First Samuel chapter 17. We, if we're going to read, we would have had to read from verse 8 all the way to verse 51. But you know the account of David and Goliath. So in First Samuel chapter 17, I'll just show you a few things. I'll highlight a few things for you so that you see what focus can do. David was the youngest son of Jesse's. And um, at this time, David had actually been sent, pay attention, to what's his name? To Saul, to play the, the harp for Saul when the evil spirit came upon him. But he went to visit his father. And Saul and his men had gone to the battlefront because they were contending with the Philistines. So David got, Goliath in verse 8 was the first person that we saw. In verse 8, Goliath deployed focus. And he used it to dictate what the army of Israel focused on. In verse 8, he said to, in, in, in verse 8, let's go to first Samuel. I do not want, even though I don't want to read it, I want you to see what it is that I'm talking about. 17 verse number 8. First Samuel. In verse 8, he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel. This was Goliath. And said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? I, I, am I not a Philistine? And you, servants of Saul, choose you a man for you and let him come down to me. You don't understand he took the army of Israel, the men of war of Israel, in that one sentence, and he reduced them to servants of Saul. He flipped their identity on them. He, 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 what, this is what they call mind games. He stood in front of them and he got them to shift how they saw themselves. He said, I'm a Philistine. He defined himself properly. And he didn't say you were Israelites. He didn't say you are members of the Israelite army. He said you are servants of Saul. So automatically, the men start to think about themselves as servants of Saul. In verse 11, it worked. Because from Saul to every man there became dismayed and afraid. All of a sudden, from the king to imagine people left their homes to go to war. They got there, they just camped. One man came out and said, Are you not servants? And that was all. Because he painted a picture of a weak person. And so that picture was stuck in their mind. Before you knew it, if the other men couldn't go to war, the king is exposed, plus the king, plus the men. The Bible said they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Focus. Then the men of Israel, the men of Israel knew. They knew that they couldn't go home without fighting, without someone fighting Goliath. That's what happens. So in, you see them, they started to say, they say, you see this Goliath man, somebody, he's just, he's messing with us. Somebody needs to stand up fighting. <laughs> this, all of the men of war <coughs> started to have conversations about who will fight Goliath. They came to war. They were not at home. They were not by the stream. They were not nursing fathers. They were not on paternity leave. They had left home. Their wives and their children were praying that their fathers and their husbands were at war. They gathered in pockets and they say, where will we find the person that will fight Goliath? They forgot that they were in the battlefield. 
So they were having the conversation. Say, who's going to find? What? They, and they were discussing. They say, it would be nice if the king sweetened the deal by giving the person this and giving the person that. They were not saying, can three of us try? They said, let's look for the person and convince the person that the king has gifts that he will give to him if he fought Goliath. The next thing I saw was David showed up because David had perspective. His perspective was forming. In verse 26, when he got there and said, what did you people say that we do to the man that takes down this person? What's going to be? Because his mind was working. It's like, are they honestly discussing what they will give? To? Okay, come and tell me. What is it that you see? You say, we, I will get, or someone will get if they fought this person and they killed him. By his perspective, right there he defined Goliath. Because Goliath started by defining the armies of Israel. And in talking to him, he said, come, what will be done to this person if he kills this man? And he said, by the way, who is this uncircumcised Philistine to dare to defy the armies of the living God? Can you see? In one sentence, he just not only, he tried to revalidate the men and then he described Goliath properly, uncircumcised Philistine. So, no matter what happened after that, all that David could see was an uncircumcised Philistine. He did not see a man of war. He did not see a giant. He did not see someone who's never been defeated before. All that he saw was uncircumcised Philistine. Now, because he was focusing on an uncircumcised Philistine, he knew it was impossible to go to war against an uncircumcised Philistine as a member of the family of God who had covenant and be run over. Focus. While David was going on and on, Eliab showed up. I want you to see, I'm, I'm highlighting these things because I want you to see the different players in this account and see how mindsets can lock people up. Eliab was upset. And he said, everywhere David shows up, he upsets the place. Yet David refused to be distracted and refused to be derailed. His brother said, what are you doing here? Are you troublemaker? Who did you leave the little sheep with? He said, which trouble did I cause? Oh, by the way, as I was saying, what did you say will happen? If, can, we, can somebody take me to the king? I want to tell him that we can take this man. Because sometimes it is not your focus, but someone throws it on you. I have, I have a new rule. If I don't want to quarrel with you, set fire around me. I will not quarrel with you. I told Antonia, I said, you will be surprised that I will be the first person to say sorry every time. And that's because I am focused on something else. You want to quarrel. Now I can't. I, I will say sorry. Before you finish, the reality is, as you're going, I'm not hearing no. Because I shut down. Because I'd made up my mind I won't quarrel with you yet. So I can't be focused. If I heard what you're saying, in the night, the devil will wake me up. And begin to remind, but no, I don't have that. I will not hear. I cannot hear. And then when you finish and I, you stop to catch your breath, I'll say, no, very sorry. Because you see this, you see that harvest? Maybe you guys don't understand. I am invested in the harvest. So David did like me. Uh, um, uncle, um, did you say you were going to the king's tent? Eliab was fuming. David don't work out. David gets to the king's tent and the king said, Ha! Ah, you are but a boy now. He has been a man of war. David was focused on, I know that this guy is coming down. So David said to the king, you see, while I was at the back of the desert, the bear came. Tried to steal my sheep. With my bare hands, I tore him into shreds. The lion came. Tried to steal a sheep. I tore him. 
with my bare hands into pieces. And the way I see it, this uncircumcised, the thing I like David, he never mentioned his name. He never called him Goliath. Every time he was like, this uncircumcised Philistine will be as one of those two. He was focused. He was focused. He was focused. So he said, mm, let me just give you background why I know I can do this. God has been with me with a bear. God has been with me with a lion. I know God will be with me with the uncircumcised Philistine. Because here's the reality. The uncircumcised Philistine is worse than a dog. In the sight of covenanted people. But when you are focused on just his muscles. Let's not even talk about the fact that that guy was not all that. Let's leave that. And let's just focus on what David was thinking. He said a number of things. He said, King, I have, an experience, I have had experience with wild animals. And they didn't take me. But beyond that, I know the hand of God. So he wasn't looking at what everyone else was looking. In 2000, I believe it was 2014. Mm -hmm. Yes, it was 2014. Towards the end of the year. You know, it was pre-election year. And people were going crazy that Nigeria was going to disintegrate. And they were busy. People were telling, in fact, I can't tell you how many people told me, if you can, any small naira, naira you get, use it to buy dollar and keep it. I was saying, it's not supposed to, supposed to say that has naira that buys dollar and keep. But God told me something. So even when the economics had their projections, even when the politicians had their projections, the security gurus had their... Pro there were, the projections were many. I was determined that what God told me was what I was going to focus on. And I told everybody, Val would be my witness. My husband was here. With, I told them, I said, as long as you are focused on the fact that Nigeria belongs to God, God says even when people are running, you... This same land that they are running away from that they say is going to break, it will be yielding you money. They were like, ah, you are too optimistic. This, your belief in God is doing you something in your head. Ha <laughs> ha, let me not tell you something. But why they were focused on fear, they made many mistakes. They lost things. Because people were even afraid. Um, um, Uncle Wale, do you remember that at the beginning of that 2015, business is for like until after May, May 29, businesses did not do anything. This fear crippled them. A few weeks before that election, how many of us saw the pictures of the Lagos airport? Even cockroaches bought tickets. Everybody wanted to leave. And I was just thinking, may the evil go safe so that I can have space to keep what is coming. How people did not do businesses. People who God gave assignments to start new things, they did not start for five months, six months effectively, because they were waiting on what men were saying. <laughs> in the end, in First Samuel, we know how that story ended. First Samuel 17. When David went told Goliath to fight. No, the king even said to David, okay, we get it. Okay, you want to go, you are insisting. Sign this agreement that you were the one that said you should go, I did not send you. Can't go to court. David said, not a problem, I will sign it. He signed it. I'm just imagining that that was what the king did. Then the king now said, wear my armor and go. And David was like, <laughs> he wore it. The Bible said he could not move because he had not proved it. He said, king, I can't wear this. Because when your focus is your focus, even the things that men said, say to you, we kill you, are the things that the Lord, did God not say that in adversity he leaves us? He says, I have enlarged you in the place of your distress. So David said, I can't wear it, but I know what I know. I have a sling and I have five smooth stones. This is what I've been trained in. And this is what is bringing the uncircumcised Philistine down. David went close to, to, 
a distance close to the man the guy said come he said come you think i'm a dog that you come in with a stick and stone just come close i will show you who i am but david didn't go close because david knew he didn't have strength for hand-to-hand -hand combat but he knew that with that sling he knew what he was doing so why goliath was trying to come david if you read your bible the bible is very clear goliath was coming david was going backwards because he knew he needed space between him and goliath to do what he needed to do he threw the stone the stone went in the forehead he fell face down there is no way if a stone comes in the forehead, you ought to go back. But he fell fails now. But because from the beginning, from the moment he stepped into that arena, he was clear that this guy was coming down. He was clear. So everything anyone else said to him did not penetrate his beyond his ear, whatever. He knew what he had seen. And as long as he kept that picture before him, do you want to talk about what's his name jacob out of focus he got animals to produce young ones to his favor don't mess with focusing on god don't mess with it what's the anatomy of focus if i had to draw focus for you what would it look like I will draw focus for you by telling you seven things that you need to look at. Number one, turn on the light. Flip the switch. What does that mean? If you entered this room at 1 a.m. and there was no electricity and you were someone who was fearful, you know that if you entered and you stood by the door, you will think that there are giants in this room, right? How many of us know that? Because darkness would give you the illusion that something existed that did not exist. But if you went close to the wall and you flipped the switch and the lights came on, you know you're fine, right? Some of us, that's why the diet came before the focus some of us all we need to do is flip the switch of the word of god that he told us the example i was given in 2015 what i knew was what i knew god gave me a specific assignment in 2015 and he said if you do it i will do the one so no matter if you are saying what i know god did not say and you were too old for me or too senior over me or something if i respected you too much and i couldn't shut you down i would excuse myself i will not even say i'm going because you're talking against what i know i would just pack my bags and say please can i take a telephone call i have zapped because you cannot pollute anything that would affect what i'm focused on turn on the switch hold on to the word of god like your life depends on it because it depends on it actually flip the switch turn on the light what is in you what do you have has what has god spoken to you all of these things can light your path when we talk about flipping the switch sometimes you want to think about what gifts do i have in this situation david didn't know how to use the spare and the javelin and all of those things but he was clear he knew how to use a sling and smooth stones it was not the day for David to begin to try to find out how to use a sword. He stuck with the light that he had. Number two, when you want to overcome the hindrances and um, in, um, yes, hindrances and impediments to um, to focus, you want to remember that you are equipped. When uh, was his name showed up, and everybody was talking. His brother called him troublemaker. They were telling him who the Goliath was. He knew something. He knew, number one, Goliath was an uncircumcised Philistine. That one he knew. Number two, he knew he had what it took. He said to Saul, I've killed a bear before. I've killed a lion before. The way I think David was thinking was, lion will no get sense like human being. If the lion came at you, all he wants to do is kill me. I could wrestle him down. I, I can take this Philistine. He's big enough for me to take down. 
The size that was carrying the soldiers was the exact thing that David looked. David said, this one I can't miss. If I miss his head, I will catch his nose. If I, catch his, if I don't catch his nose, the mouth is using to shout, the stone will go in. If it doesn't go, it will hit his, something shall, I shall hit this man. He's big enough. So remember you are equipped. On the journey, God does not call people who do not have the stuff. God will not take you through something. It says that um, um, every um, temptation, he has made a way of escape. But beyond that is the fact that the temptation is not peculiar to you. God will not put you in a situation that has the capacity to overwhelm you if you are, not working, if you are working with him. If you're not working with him, I can't legislate for that. But if you're really working with God, he can't bring you to something that will defeat you. That's just the way it works. So recognize that you are equipped. Number three, prepare yourself. David did. Nobody, I'm not sure that when David was born, that there was one book that was opened that told him that one day he would need to fight a giant. But David had prepared himself over time. When the bear came, he didn't run to call Eliab. I have a feeling if he had gone to call Eliab, Eliab would have fed him to the bear. So in exercising himself by facing the challenges that came in the course of his day, he trained himself and equipped himself and prepared himself for this day. The thing about us today is that we all want that one battle we can fight in the limelight or maybe not even fight the battle. Just pretend that we fought the battle as long as the cameras are on us so that people will clap. Nobody believes in back street battles anymore. Nobody recognizes that you have to have slain a lot of bears and a lot of lions before you can stand before a, a, a giant remember that you are equipped but you also must prepare because remember that your equipping is potential and nobody pays money for potential potential that does not become a ski will rot potential that does not become a service will rot potential that does not become a product will rot i have never seen anybody say come i will employ you based on your potential oh you get potential take money they don't do it that way people want results so even though you were equipped, you have to make sure you were processed. You process yourself as well. Number four, fear not. Do not fear. Do not fear. <laughs> Do not fear. Do not fear. Again, remember, everybody cowered before Goliath. But David never saw Goliath. David saw uncircumcised philistine that made him it made him target for god number five m y o b mind your own business there was an article i did a long time ago and i said do not go to battle in another man's armor mind your own business when Eliab went, into, went to town and was talking, David was minding his business. When Goliath was speaking, David was minding his business. When Saul was suggesting, David was minding his business. Maybe if you don't know what your business is, you won't be able to mind it. But if you know, just stick with what you know. Stick with what you know. I was told before that of all the things to boast of is words. You're going around saying your superpower is words. That who exactly, as long as you're not mute, you can use words. That was what I was told. And I told them, I said, no, you don't understand. Everybody can use words. I have been gifted with words. That's the difference. So my words are not just necessary words. They are liberating words. They are delivering words. They are empowering words. They are enabling words. They are equipping words. Just name it. If it is positive, my words can bet it. So why you think that everybody, does, it's common? No, it may look like what you know, but it is not what you know. Mind your own business. So while they were making mouth and complaining and quarreling, I was busy getting better at my capacity to use words because, guy, it was the only thing I had. Number six, 
watch out for distraction deceit or deceitful distraction deceitful distraction goliath said come close if david wanted to prove something you need to recognize that when you are on a journey with god you have nothing to prove i've said it before let me remind you again i have nothing to prove and because i have nothing to prove when people offer me to buy uh, followers on instagram i can't buy because i have nothing to prove the four thousand people that follow me made their up their mind by themselves to follow me that's the way it works i have nothing to prove absolutely nothing to prove let me say it one more time i am not proving anything to anybody watch out for the things they they package them where they look like they are clapping for you but they know that you are dying soon don't let people push you into things that do not concern you distraction deceit goliath said come close david said me and you as you're coming how many steps are you taking i'm taking double the number of steps back because no we can't be close distraction deceit or deceitful distraction my mother used to say that it, that the, the 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 mouse that when the mouse wants to deal with you he begins by blowing you he'll blow you it will blow you to ensure that you sleep some more then when the sleep is deep it will bite you number seven let me tell you this and then i would focus i would send you to peter for a bit and when we close number seven maybe you don't know because a lot of us think that 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 this thing is you have nine lives like a cat let me announce to you, you don't have nine lives only one shot i need you to understand that if david missed that one shot goliath would have had him if you miss your one shot because you succumbed to all these many other things if you miss your one shot should i say it should i not say it let me not say it but you have got only what how many shots how many lives do you have reincarnation is not in the bible Don't say, when I come back, you are not coming back anywhere. Which is appointed unto man to die. After that, judgment. So if you miss your shot, you die in the process, you are done. I, I am convinced that I can't stand before God. In fact, here's the deal. When I'm coming, Jesus will have to get up. Like, ha, that girl, that girl, she's coming. They said, Jesus, where are you going? I'm going to the gate. What are you going to the gate to do? I thought we were supposed to process people to come in. So you don't understand this language. There's a girl coming. I have to meet her at the gate. She may not have done one million things, but the one thing she, she did it. She did it. That one shot, this one life, heaven will not say I wasted it. I may not have started on time, but heaven cannot tell me that I wasted this life. It's a decision and it's my focus. So there are many things that I will not be able to do. There are many places that I can't go. There are a ton of things that I can't boast that I know. But you see this one? Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. You will know that I know it. You will know. You have one shot. If you go to the book of Matthew, you will see Peter. Peter was in the boat with many people. Focus. And they saw someone coming, walking on water. Matthew 14. And Peter, everybody looked and said, it's a ghost. And when Jesus spoke, Peter said, it's not a ghost. It's the master. And he said, master, if it is you, ask me to come. Bid me to come. That's where Chigose got his song from, by the way. And the Lord said, come. And the Bible said Peter stepped out of the boat and started to walk on water. And he kept walking on water until he looked around. 
And the Bible said he began to sink. And Jesus said to him, Why? Why? It says it like this is looking on to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, the beginning and the end of it all. Why do you want to start a journey with Jesus and 11 years later consider anything else? Why do you want to start a journey with Jesus and just because money dried up, your faith dries up too? Why do you want to start a journey with Jesus and because someone died, you said, I cannot forgive God? Why do you want to begin a journey with Jesus and because you died, you say, I know, do again? <laughs> you like, can somebody who is dead say they can't do it again? I don't know, I'm just saying. I'm saying that not even death should separate you from the love of God. This journey is too sweet. We know the end. Even if we don't know what tomorrow holds, don't you know the one who holds tomorrow? I can't sit here and tell you I'm sure of anything because you know, I know there are some men and women of God who are sure. But, um, I have faith that God will be kind to me. But I know that I can't look back. No. I cannot look back again. There is nothing that the world has from you see this man i'm focused on him in rain in, sh in sunshine in abundance in lack in sickness in health in wealth in nothing as long as jesus is before me it is all that I, he is all that i need to arrive where i need to go the question in the end is you claim you're journeying with god what's your focus because when you tell me what your focus, you don't even need to tell me. How you spend your money tells me who your focus is. Your language, the words you use, tells me who your focus is. Your posture in certain situations sell you out what your focus is. But I know that you can't be going with God and be looking and be afraid and be listening to people and be wondering what people would say. Saul thought about what people would say. He went and offered a sacrifice he had no clearance to offer. He truncated his journey. When you are not focused on Jesus, but I know you are focused on Jesus. So how about you choose him one more time this afternoon and say, Lord, you are my focus. Father, you are my focus. My king and my maker. You are my focus. If you're online and you have not given your life to Jesus, or you're even in here and you're not quite sure about your life in Christ's hands, today is the day that you say, Lord Jesus, I give you my life. Lord Jesus, I give you my life. Lord Jesus, I give you my life. Then the rest of us pray. Pray that you will see that as you flip on the switch, that the word that God gave you, you'll be holding on to it. That you'll not veer from it. You'll not turn to the left and to the right. That you would arrive where you need to go in God. Speak to Jesus. Say, Lord, you are my focus. Father, you are my focus. Oh, Lord, you are my focus. Yes, Lord, you are my focus. Father, Lord, we thank you. We give you all the praise. Thank you for this journey, O oh God. We've chosen you and will continue to choose you. Let your name be glorified forever. Thank you, God of heaven. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. God bless you.